The problem I have, which is something I would like to discuss, is that right now I think the, the, the main narrative that is developing, unlike back in 2017 when I was discussing with Fluffy Pony about Monero, is uh, basically Bitcoin. Uh, you know, in Bitcoin, you have no privacy. Just use Monero, your privacy is perfect. And especially just use Monero on the fly uh, as a privacy tool and you are set and, and it's good for everybody. It is simpler than using Bitcoin privacy. And I would like to push back, especially on these, which I find is also a dangerous representation. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Monero.com Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on iOS and Android too. Monero.com Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by IVPN. Resist online surveillance with IVPN a privacy-focused, audited, and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. Monero.com Wallet and iVPN are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in our YAT free speech money into your Monero.com or Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk, Doug sits down with two powerhouse guests. Giacomo Zucco, a Bitcoin OG known for his strong technical understanding of Bitcoin and his belief that all other cryptos will eventually trend to zero against Bitcoin, and set for privacy, a privacy and Monero tech expert. Giacomo laid out his criticism of Monero and allowed Seth and Doug to thoroughly respond to each point. The fact is, most of these things have been covered in one form or another on Monero Talk already, but this was an epic, thorough overview. So much so that we had to break this one into three episodes. Listen close, a lot is covered. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Giacomo, thank you so much, man, for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. I know we have... have we have Seth coming on, but uh, I think I have five minutes alone with you before he gets on, so I could I, I could attack you now before you know before uh, we have our buffer here. Oh, so you are the bad cop, and he's the good cop. So that's the, that's the role. Okay, understand. <laughs> I would have no chance against you, man. You're 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 impenetrable, and I and I respect <laughs> that. You've uh you've been consistent. I'll 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 definitely give you that. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for doing. Well, it. Actually, Douglas. Tonight is a sign of inconsistent to me because actually I decided for a policy of zero shitcoin discussion back back at the end in 2019. So now I'm breaking it. Oh and wow! I, you have to know that like Monero discussions, I had a lot. I, I invited Fluffy Pony during the Milan Bitcoin meetup to discuss Monero and Bitcoin publicly. I was super happy about it. It was a very good faith discussion. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. Both sides were at pre great arguments. Then we did the same with uh, David uh, D David Vorick for Namecoin and Sayacoin, and it was great. Then we did the same with, uh, I think it was Jack Greek for Zcash. But after that, basically I started to be completely flooded by requests to debate, but, it were, but not as much in good faith as then. Uh, things started to shift around 2000, I think 2017. It was becoming unbearable because it was just a pretense to just try to shield. And it became uh, so. Even the the amount of good good faith discussion I could have back then was uh, was basically completely flooded by DDoS attempt to, to just shield yeah, any right. kind of shit. Right. And even right. like Jack, Jack Greek was great, but after him, a lot of people took advantage to shield Zcash in a very uncomfortable way for me. And mm -hmm. so basically, I decided that every time there is a even if in the merit of the discussion could be there. My heuristic, my social heuristic has become uh, the, the, the signal may become overcome by the noise. So I would just stay away. If there is a coin involved, I just stay away as a, as a anti-spam heuristic. So tonight, since uh, so you have been very gentle uh, in the invitation and Seth has been uh, uh, like um, war heartedly suggested uh, to me by promoted to me by Steph Oliveira as a super good faith. Uh, debater and uh, his website is great. So I decided to break to to become inconsistent with my with my zero shitcoin tolerance policy and to discuss with you guys. <laughs> Cheers, man! Wow, uh, I'm honored. I'm honored. Um, 
so so what what really you know is it just because you know S seth is a reasonable person or is there is there something about uh monero and the environment that you thought it's 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 worth a discussion at this point i think there is i, I decided to stop discussion on many things even when i thought that there is something interesting to discuss because i i think that the chance for the interesting discussion discussion to be buried below the uninteresting shilling is is high but there always have been something interesting about monero for me the first thing is the just the ideology the idea that the striving for for better privacy i think is something that uh, i don't think it's it's through the the representation and the bitcoin that is lost the problem is that in bitcoin that's relatively lost like people caring for privacy are more now than back then in bitcoin but the share the relative share of people caring for privacy among all the new comings is, is shrinking uh obviously and so the monero kept uh, rem remained smaller and kept a more more genuine and consistent attention to privacy and then even technologically there are a few things in monero that i think are are, are pretty interesting especially uh, like the some of the choice well, probably we will discuss about that but uh, mm -hmm. some of the choice about uh, uh, it's, it's very difficult to do something like spv in monero so basically either you go full trusted or you do or you basically have a node for real there are some architecture choices that i think are interesting even the recent discussion about tail emission it's it's interesting because monero has that and and i, I think there is a lot to discuss in uh, about that with uh, with an open mind i don't think bitcoin will or should change anyhow close to our, uh, close to those goals but uh, but they are theoretically interesting and what? and there is a third thing I, I, I will be very careful to say this. I did say that in a few podcasts years ago, but I think Monero can be used as a tool with real life utility, just not in the same way that is being mindlessly promoted as just use Monero as a privacy panacea, you will be set. I think the Monero can be part of the tool set of somebody who is using uh, pay, uh, payment technology with a strong privacy need. So I don't think it's useless in the real life. Awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring Seth on. He's here. Oh sure. Great. Seth, what's going on, man? Hey guys. Hey Doug. I I, hey, I couldn't help but uh start the convo without you. I wanted to, I wanted to get some alone time with Giacomo. <laughs> Yeah, I got stuck uh, in traffic. Sorry to sorry to delay a little uh, bit, but Douglas re good. revealed me all your uh, the talking points and tactics. So now uh, it's over. <laughs> Pre gamed, nice. <laughs> yeah, Mo, can you just uh, I just continue on that point you were making? So you you do see Monero potentially being used, you know, having a use case, um, and being part of a tool set. What do you see as being its its potential use? Well, mostly if uh, you have a very serious need to uh, move some wealth, some value in a way that obfuscates the uh, the payment graph and you need a stronger anonymity set that you know what you're doing, uh, I think that uh, using Monero for a proficient uh, person can help. Of course, there will be some risk. There will be the slippage risk with the price, which in short term can be manageable. There will be a lot of... Uh, uh complexity because you're assuming well probably we will discuss about that but what i mean is that monero can be used as a privacy tool it's not a scam in that sense just like i mean i've seen people using uh, uh the, uh, abusing the idea of dApps on ethereum just because they didn't care to buy some uh, host uh, hosted space on a website that they wanted a stateful app running without a server it was it was stupid because it was uh, uh, basically costing uh, 30 million times in AWS. But it was simpler to just put some pseudo JavaScript uh, solidity there. So, so I think that in general, altcoins can have practical use. I, I've been, I'm ashamed to, to tell this, but in 2017, because of my friend Federico, I had to receive a Dogecoin payment because he, he really was insisting to send me like $3. So he basically sent me this, the, this Doge coin because it was insisting to try it, and uh, I'm I, I, I'm ashamed to admit it, but it, it can be used. The problem I have, which is something I would like to discuss, is that right now I think the the, the main narrative that is developing, uh, unlike back in 2017 when I was discussing with Fluffy Pony about Monero, is uh, 
basically bitcoin uh, in bitcoin you have no privacy just use monero your privacy is perfect and especially just use monero on the fly uh, as a privacy tool and you are set and and it's good for everybody it's simpler than using bitcoin privacy and i would like to push back especially on these which i find is also a dangerous representation and i think i think said will agree with this but oh, so if you don't mind i guess I, I will i would like to so i have three main points where i think we could discuss and disagree okay the first one is more important but i would like to basically touch it uh, as least and so the first one is i i think that every single coin which is not bitcoin is a shit coin mm -hmm. but this discussion is not monero specific so even if it's a strong point for me I would like to postpone this discussion about scarcity and barter at hard the money. end. Hard money, sure. Yeah. The, the second point will be more Monero specific. Some objection I have. I mean, if I assumed that uh, that uh, uh, that the point one was wrong, so that we can have altcoins, multi coins. If I agree with that, and I don't, Monero will still have some something that I would consider some flaws, and I would like to discuss those. But even more important, a third level, third point. Even if Monero was perfect, I think that some of the current narratives that I'm seeing around Monero promotion are factually false. So I think that we could start with that and we could agree on some basic fact level things, even before technical opinions or, or like or prediction or something. Just I, I would like to, to challenge a few okay. assumptions about facts. So, wait, wait, what, what was your second one, though? I under, your, your first is basically the, first is the argument of, in general, of, like maximalism. Like, Bitcoin yeah. is the hardest money, and because of that, everything else. Uh, and then yeah. we we could discuss whether or not that is true, and whether or not Big Monero could compete and potentially be harder money than than Bitcoin, um, or even just coexist. I am very skeptical, right. even just about the coexistence uh, theory, the right. multi-coin theory. So the is that second, is that your second point, the coexisting? No, no, no. Still yeah. the first. Okay. The second would be specific things of Monero that I think may be misrepresented. As a trade-off, not specifically by set, especially in his, webs in his website, but in general. Mm -hmm. And the third things are basically factual, uh, factual claims about okay. uh, about the current uh, Monero marketing, not by you necessarily. Okay. Well, I, I love that you've organized this. This is amazing. Seth, Seth uh, want want to chime in and, and give some commentary on, on what you heard so far, and then uh, we'll we'll try to proceed down this uh, rabbit hole. Yeah, I mean. I... I definitely I agree on a lot of what Jack was said. Um, I think marketing around privacy tools, we have to be very, very careful. Um, so laying out the groundwork on what actual privacy guarantees are within both Bitcoin and Monero is helpful. Um, and I, I'm curious to hear more, Giacomo, on the, the second and third points to learn more about what your, I guess, misgivings or hesitancies with Monero are technically. It sounds like second, your second point is more that you have some technical issues with the approaches taken in Monero. Yeah. Um, and then also, of course, to, to talk about the, the marketing approach. Um, cause I, I think that I have been very honest in the way that I market Monero. Um, I, at least I, I hope I have, I try to be very transparent with the trade-offs and approaches taken in Monero and Bitcoin and, and other tools. Um, but I do know, obviously just like in Bitcoin, there are people in Monero that, that market it in a way that it is a perfect thing, that there, is, there are no problems that you don't need to ever worry about anything else, any other part of OPSEC, that kind of thing. And I'm sure that does happen. I don't think that's the majority, um, but we can definitely chat about that more. But um, I think, yeah, before I really have too much to comment on, I just want to um, yeah. kind of learn a little bit more about what Giacomo means by these technical issues that he has with Monero and then maybe digging into more to some of the, the false marketing claims. Yes. Yeah, okay, so we, yeah, what we, do start, you we start with point two then. Okay. Yes. Start with point Agreed. two. Agreed. So the, the first thing that I would like to comment on Monero is that sometimes that's that's re, that's commented very fast, but we never have really time to discuss it, is, is the fact that I think you do agree, because also in your website, when you dispel the, the FUD, you take this in consideration that there are serious trade-offs when, when you move from the Bitcoin structure to the crypto note and Monero structure. And the first one, which I think is not always very well understood, is, is that Chitter, Chitter is paribus. Uh, Bitcoin scalability sucks because it's public consensus. So it sucks. Every node has to record any state change forever, which uh, at least until we have some kind of zero knowledge magic, which sucks. But in Monero, everything will always be strictly worse, Chitter is paribus, because uh, in, in your website, you mentioned the size of the transaction. 
but I think that the other point is mostly the STX offset, the fact that you with resignature you cannot really rule out the spent transactions. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep it, you cannot even keep it in memory. Uh, so now you use uh, like faster databases, which is fine, but everything you do with database and with stuff, if Bitcoin has a problem of scalability, and I think it does, a very serious problem, Monero will always have a more serious problem with that, including not just 3x, 4x transactions, but especially uh, especially about uh, STX, STX growing. So much so that I think it's a fair claim that Monero could not sustain the current uh, uh, Bitcoin usage, which is not even that much. No, nobody really uses Bitcoin yet. And I think that Monero will not really be able to sustain that even just from the point of uh, STXO growth. Would you agree with that? Um, I don't agree with the kind of the in claim there. Um, and I'm, I would love to hear if you have some more evidence for why you think that not having a prunable UTXO set is that vital at Bitcoin scale? I mean, like you said, Bitcoin scale, even when maxed out on capacity is, is nothing crazy from a throughput, from a uh, bandwidth perspective, from a disk pr perspective. Um, and so when you're looking at Monero, yes, per transaction, we have larger transactions. Um, but one of the, I mean, the first blog post I ever wrote was focusing on, yes, Monero's transactions are larger. Um, and these are these are two separate things. And the transaction size, obviously, like you mentioned, is separate from the TXO set. But well, let me just quickly address the transaction size aspect first. Um, and I think one that is often overlooked or forgotten is that if you're using Bitcoin in a private way, generally you will require as much disk space, bandwidth, uh, compute, or more than Monero because you have to make multiple transactions to gain privacy and then be able to spend privately. Um, again, it depends on what tool you're using. If you're using Join Market, it's less transactions generally than if you're using Samurai Wallet. But um, in either of those cases, you're having to make multiple transactions to be able to make one privacy-preserving transaction. Um, and with Monero, you only have to make the one. So the actual transaction size trade-off is, in my opinion, minor. If we're looking at it from, we actually want people to have any semblance of privacy and not just deterministic links everywhere. Um, as far as the TXO set goes, uh, that is one of the biggest drawbacks to using something like ring signatures or uh, um, the kind of accumulator style global uh, anonymity set that Zcash uses as well. The same thing exists in any of these systems where you hide what the true spend is. Um, and obviously the, the benefit you get from this is immense. It's, it's absolutely massive and that you do not have a clear true spend in any transaction. Um, and even if you go a step further and you have larger ring sigs or you have uh, a, a global anonymity set, you essentially can never tell, or at least in, in the real world, you can never tell what the true spend in a, is, a tr is in a transaction, um, which is a, a massive change from Bitcoin and breaks deterministic links completely. Whereas within Bitcoin, using privacy tools like Samurai Wallet, we're able to, to use anonymity sets to make it hard enough that those deterministic links don't matter anymore. Um, and that is important and that's functional, but that also, like I said, takes a lot of disk space, takes a lot of transaction size space, fees, et cetera. Um, and it takes a lot of headache for users to actually go through that process where in Monero you gain that. Um, and really it is a big drawback that you can't just prune the spent transaction output set. Um, Cause obviously in Bitcoin, when you're running a prune node, you're generally keeping the UTXO set and then some set of blocks, some set of recent blocks. It depends on the parameters you set. But um, And the, the power of that is because you can do simple wallet scanning and you can keep the UTXO set. You can gain the vast majority of what you need from a node while still running a prune node. Um, again, there's always nuance. You can't run a lightning node with some parameters depending on exactly what you're doing. But um, generally, you can do most of the things you need with a prune Bitcoin node, and you only have to keep that UTXO set, really, and then some recent blocks. Um, and then Monero, you can, we call it pruning. Honestly, we should call it sharding more than, yeah. we, we really shouldn't be calling it pruning right now, I don't think. Um, but right now, the the kind of middle ground approach that's taken is with within Monero, if you run a pruned node, which is the language used on the actual command line, um, you can reduce your storage requirements and that, that does it in two ways and that you essentially keep a shard of the network. You keep some of the blockchain data and then you go out and query other nodes for the rest of it, um, which is very much a different trade-off than a pruned Bitcoin node. Um, but then there's also other blockchain data that you can prune freely. Um, 
that's not the actual TXO set. So you do definitely, you, you suffer if you're trying to run a node that is pruned. Um, but if you're trying to run a full node versus a Bitcoin full node, it's, it's very similar um, in effect. But like you said, if we were running Monero at Bitcoin's transaction size, um, at Bitcoin's transaction count, I mean, it would be larger growth. It would be larger uh, disk space usage, usage larger compute. Um, and that is definitely a, a concern long term. Um, and I think that's more of a concern if you're looking for Monero to be like the world reserve currency. I think if you if you approach the trade offs that Monero makes from a different perspective and more of a cypherpunk perspective than a hyper Bitcoinization perspective, the trade offs make a lot more sense um, because they're more focused, in my opinion, they're more focused on those people who wake up to the need for privacy, who wake up to the need for financial freedom and who decide to take actionable steps um, are going to come and use Monero. Not everyone in the world is going to come and use Monero, in my opinion. I, just like I don't think everyone in the world is going to use Bitcoin, especially not in a non-custodial way. Um, so I think the trade-offs make a lot more sense in the, the ethos that I think is behind a lot of Monero's decisions. But that TXO set having to be kept is definitely a drawback, but the benefit of breaking every single deterministic link in the network is absolutely incredible. And that is a, a, a core reason why Monero's privacy is so strong and so simple and approachable and scalable comparatively to privacy on Bitcoin, cheap, et cetera. Um, Cause you're able to do that at a, a network and consensus level rather than doing it just at a opt-in user level. So if you, specific uh like counter arguments to what you said and then a more general one the specific specific ones are first you you say that uh, um in your opinion the uh the stress on bitcoin for a bandwidth and uh, and cpu for validation right now is not that much but i consider that if you compare like the cost of actually thinking uh, doing IB, uh, ibd on on bitcoin on uh, on a non best case scenario so especially in some scenario which may require you to use Tor because maybe you are under some problematic network surveillance or you are not in the best internet connection or you don't have a computer like mine, but you have something closer to a Raspberry Pi, which we use as a toy, but could be closer to some kind of uh, smartphone situation. That's that's already like a smartphone is already uh, is already beyond the capacity of Bitcoin at this point because uh, uh, from the point of, uh, of your storage, it's fine. You can prune, but but from the point of view of, of bandwidth for the loading and CPU power to validate everything, it's already super stressful to use Bitcoin uh, trustlessly. And indeed, from one point of view, you have the, the creeping idea of custodianship. So just not use Bitcoin and ask third parties to do it yourself. But the other creeping idea is to use uh, delegated verification. So I keep my keys, but I don't know if I've been paid or not, which especially for privacy is pretty bad. Like right now, if you typically somebody will use a cell phone wallet or, or even Electrum or a computer, and as a default, they will connect to some other node that will maybe register the ClearNet IP together with their UTXO set. And even, um, I don't want to enter into that, but since you, men you mentioned uh, Whirlpool, if you use Samurai in a default way, then you will have this problem, which is also connected to the fact that uh, downloading and validating the Bitcoin blockchain is, 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 is not trivial. And I think that Monero, even if it doesn't go to the world reserve currency scenario, if it wants to even just replace, let's just, it wants to replace Bitcoin completely in the dark web market, which is something I would like to discuss later. Uh, even just there, we will have to, uh, to, to, to face a stronger problem with uh, initial, well, as you say, not that stronger, probably three times stronger, four times stronger. And then the SDU, the, the, the UTXO, which is not really UTXO because it's not you, the, the TXO set, uh, which is not, it's even worse because it has to stay in memory, basically. I mean, you can virtualize, you can, you can, you can put in a database, but basically in order to validate quickly, that's, that's even more sensitive stuff than the blockchain itself, where I just have to suffer once and then it's there forever. So I, I agree with everything you said, but I will put a, a way more um, concerned uh, accent on, on everything, which already in Bitcoin, I think in Bitcoin it's bad already. I think the, the trade of choices made in Monero will make it eventually worse, especially if you try to expand more. But let me give you a more general uh, counter argument. 
if I if I could change Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin will be super hard to change, and we have we will have to change the second layers and the tools. But if I could change Bitcoin in a fundamental way, the direction I will go for privacy will not uh, privacy by obfuscation, but privacy by omission. What I mean is privacy by obfuscation is every node keeps uh, track of every transaction forever, but this track is cryptographically obfuscated or non-cryptographically obfuscated, like uh, doing a, a, a stone wall or doing a ricochet or doing all this stuff. You, it can be in, it can be still obfuscation. So you put a lot of stuff that you don't need on the blockchain, either cryptographic uh, uh, add-on or non-cryptographic add-on, so you weaken the deterministic link. But this is strictly incentive incompatible because even if uh, even if you make it op if you make it opt-in like Zcash, that's a disaster because people will try to spend less and they will only use uh, the super traceable ticks instead of the of the shielded ones. So uh, Zcash is an example of a complete disaster of incentive compatibility. But even in uh, in Monero, where you make it by default, not non opt-in, still you have this kind of tension between uh, scalability and, and privacy. While if you go on the other side and you try to, to do privacy by omission, and with that, I mostly think about, uh, for example, signature aggregation uh, to incentivize CoinJoin or Lightning Network, uh, or uh, even the idea that I'm trying to sponsor in Bitcoin about client-side validation, which is idea of, of Peter Todd by, from 2016, which is on the blockchain, you should just have public keys that are spent, that's all, no amount, no scripts, because those stuff should be just passed from one guy to the other client side. And then you just use the blockchain as a single use seal, uh, basically closing. So I think that the, if I if I did have to, uh, to basically uh, shock, uh, to, to destroy the Bitcoin and make it uh, again for privacy, I think that the more sustainable path that I would be more interested in seeing would be privacy by omission, where less and less things go on the global consensus. Why? What I see in Zcash and in Monero, Monero is slightly better because at least it's not opt-in, is, is, is just uh, obfuscation putting more and more stuff on global consensus, which I think even if we can debate on the state of the trade-off right now, is generally speaking, and uh, it's, it's, it's an incentive incompatible because people will, we will, people will not be able to pretend they are doing that to save money. So they just give up a lot of plausible deniability as well. Like if you use lightning in a private way, which is super hard, we will, we will discuss that. But if you do, if you manage to do it, you have a very strong plausible deniability claim that you are just saving fees. You are not mixing. You are just, you are just avoiding the blockchain because the blockchain is expensive. And you cannot do that in Monero. You have to, you have basically, if you spend even, so let's assume you have two, spending patterns, Bitcoin and Monero. And somebody asks you, why are you using the Monero one? And you spend more, a little bit more, even just a little. That basically means that you are actively obfuscating. While if you go on something like Lightning, which I don't want to overstate, of course, Lightning right now, it's a privacy nightmare. But in theory, if you go toward obfuscation from the global consensus, then you everybody does it because they save money. And when they do it, they have an excuse to do that, which is which is plausibly deniable. Oh boy! Yeah, so what? a lot to <laughs> on there. Uh, anything you want to comment on, Doug? Before I jump in. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I have a ton of things to comment on, but I don't, I don't want to hog hog it up. Yeah, I want you two brains to uh, to be talking to each other. I mean, for me, Giacomo, it, it kind of gets to actually goes to the hard money thing, which I know you want to talk about later, but. I mean, you're, I'm sure you think it's vital that that Bitcoin is decentralized, right? You think it's vital that Bitcoin must be censorship resistant. Uh, why don't you think it's vital vital that Bitcoin must be fungible on the protocol level, uh, even to the degree where some there may be some sacrifice in terms of you know the, the the size of the blockchain? Why are you okay with making these sacrifices for other aspects? Of Bitcoin, but you don't see something like fungibility as being a, a vitally important element. I think that fungibility is vital, but I don't agree that we uh, that is something you can achieve technically. Uh, just to give you an example, a Bitcoin mined in a different uh, 
halving era is not strictly, strictly fungible. If the market decided to value the Bitcoin, uh, uh, the, the, the Coinbase uh, with, uh, with, uh, f- uh, with uh, five, uh, 50 Bitcoin, uh, less than the Coinbase with 25 Bitcoin, there are always, the, the, in, in Monero and in Bitcoin as well, there is always basically, well, in Mon- actually in Monero, probably you can fuck it up, but in Bitcoin, that's not fungible, basically. So f- f- uh, fungibility is, is basically a social construct that with halving period and difficulty level, managed to kick in Bitcoin. And there is not a technical guarantee that it remains. People could even find the cash unfungible based on serial numbers. The point that people has to basically consider things the same. I think that fungibility is ultimately a known problem in, but, but, but this is, well, maybe let's jump here since Douglas asked. One of the, one of the other points that I wanted to make is uh, for example, I, I'm, I'm taking a set website. And I'm going especially in the great uh, uh, article about the fungibility, fungibility graveyard. I think that not all, but many of these things will not be solved anyhow with a protocol level privacy. Meaning that the problem we are facing here is basically either blacklisting or whitelisting. And the only thing that the technical fungibility will create is just integral whitelisting or integral blacklisting with fewer plausible deniability. For example, let's let's take the first. Um, so a user uh, Binance SDG account is frozen upon attempted withdrawal to Wasabi Wallet for mixing. So if you, instead of having Bitcoin, which is fairly unfungible in, in theory, and then having fungibility tools that are easy to detect, and then they just prevent, they froze my account because I, 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 I withdraw so, to, to Wasabi, my claim is that if I use Monero instead, I will not solve at all this stuff because the same regulatory pressure or market pressure, in this case, probably regulatory pressures that, that, that are pushing these bad actors to prevent me from, from caring for my fucking privacy and security will just push them to tell me not use Monero at all. So it's not like we, we tend to assume when we discuss fungibility that when you use Monero, you keep everything as equal. But it's not the case. If I ask, if, if Binance is telling me no Wasabi, most likely every, every conceivable juridical or logical uh, thought will end up to the same conclusion. They will tell you no Monero, just like no Wasabi. There is no, there is not equilibrium situation in where they tell you, you can download Monero where you can, we cannot see anything, but don't do that on Wasabi. Since, since in Bitcoin you could avoid it, I think that it's better to have a partial, I, I mean, it's better to have Bitcoin where you have problem of censorship with some tools than to use a, a, a tool that will likely be censored at all. With this, I don't mean that we need to, to beg Binance to accept Monero or Bitcoin. What I mean is that at, at equilibrium, uh, companies that are debt compromised that will prevent the user from running personal security tools like like CoinJoin, we we need to know which they are to avoid them entirely and to route around them entirely because they are, anyway, they are just doomed to refuse Bitcoin eventually. Uh, So I I, I agree with Douglas that fungibility is fundamental, but I don't think fungibility is something you can achieve by enforcing in protocol level. Uh, They will just ban, blacklist the entire protocol, forcing you to use uh, some central bank currency instead or, or some other currency instead. There is no guarantee that you can use the currency. So splitting inside the currency or across, dif- across different currencies is not really a difference, juridically speaking. Uh, they can tell you no Wasabi or they can tell you no Monero. What I think is important more than, than fungibility but connected is privacy. So other parts of, of set website in, in, this, in this page are are not about uh, like blacklist, but they are about knowing who you are, getting private information from you. And that's, I think, what would be super prioritary to fix in Bitcoin, more prioritary than everything else. Not uh, the reason I think of obfuscation is not the best thing. I don't think obfuscation is not worth it uh, because uh, this is not important. I think it's not worth it because we have an alternative, which is omission, which would achieve 
something similar in a more complex way, but in a more incentive compatible way. Sorry if I if I go too long. No, 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 no. These are all important things. Uh, I mean, my my I I can I get I can respond for days on that, but I want to go to Seth. I'll just say my one response is, you know, I, I think it's important to note that Monero is striving to be digital cash today, not not you know to hope to be it in the future, and it's making its design decisions based on that, so that it can be you know fungible and digital cash and private today, as opposed to banking on some you know solutions in the future and striving to achieve it in the future. Uh, and, you know, I think these other points that you brought up with regards to, to, to fungibility, uh, maybe we'll touch upon them again when we talk about uh, hard money, you know, Bitcoin is hard, the hardest money. Seth, go ahead, take it away. Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer the fungibility thing real quick, and then I want to jump back to, to what we were talking about before that. But I think the main thing to keep in mind for me with fungibility is, yes, someone could blacklist all of Monero, and that has happened. Delistings are not uh, rare. Not getting listed is common obviously coinbase still doesn't list monero which is crazy um and that is the downside big quotes downside to actually doing things right and having a fungible currency is that they have to decide all or nothing are they going to fight the entire cryptocurrency the entire network the entire community or like within bitcoin do they want to just fight the one percent the 0.5 percent whatever it is that actually care about user privacy enough. Um, and I think the the thing to keep in mind is Monero brings fungibility to every user, both the people who could care less about privacy and the people who are who are who uh, have a deep understanding of their threat model. They understand that they're under targeted surveillance. They, they have a very complex approach, very complex OPSEC. But in Monero, the beautiful thing is everyone gets strong privacy guarantees and thus the currency as a whole is fungible. And so we force governments, regulators, exchanges, merchants, et cetera, to decide, do I want to accept this? And then I, I have actually much less of a regulatory burden in theory because I can't do chain analysis. I can't be tasked with paying somebody to check if these coins are tainted or not. So in theory, the burden is actually much less than accepting Bitcoin or supporting Bitcoin. Obviously, regulators can just say no Monero and that, that happens. Um, or Bankers can just say, don't touch Monero. We're not going to give you a, a banking license or let you bank with us, that kind of thing. Um, but it makes them have to make a much broader all or nothing decision. Whereas with Bitcoin, they don't have to make that. Uh, and that's that's one of the reasons why I continue to fight for privacy on Bitcoin is because the network effect that Bitcoin has, the, the market share, the name recognition, if we were able to get protocol level fungibility, they couldn't just say no Bitcoin. Um, they could, in theory, say centralized exchanges, you can't list Bitcoin, but then the centralized exchanges die. Um, and th it's at least a harder decision for them. Do I want to, again, do I want to cost the 0.05% or whatever of my user base that actually uses these privacy tools versus if Bitcoin was fungible at the protocol level, do I want to kick off the vast majority of trading volume, the vast majority of my income? to please these regulators or do I want to find ways to route around them myself because of financial incentives. And so the lack of fungibility within Bitcoin grants perverse financial incentives to exchanges, et cetera, because they, they're not harmed by going after the few users who regulators tell them to, because it's, it's a, it's a minuscule portion of overall traffic. And it's even, if you look at statistics on how many people and how much uh, privacy preserving usage we get within Bitcoin versus Monero, Monero already does far more transactions than there are privacy preserving transactions within Bitcoin. So for them to shut out all of Monero is theoretically more costly from an exchange perspective and, and other things than to shut out just the privacy preserving Bitcoin users. Um, there's a whole nother part to get into there where the majority of the fungibility graveyard is Wasabi because their broken protocol led to lots of people being uh, being traced, having problems with the, the the fee address being a problem. There, there are lots of other reasons why Wasabi was worse because they, they could clearly see using chain analysis that someone was using Wasabi and was within a certain distance of bad actors that they claimed. Um, that's a whole other topic. But I think on the fungibility issue, I, I would much rather the tool make regulators and governments have to make a hard all or nothing decision than be able to go after that small portion of people who understand the need for personal privacy. Um, and those are, I think, the big differences within fungibility. And, and obviously, I, I think it's a benefit when the, the protocol as a whole is fungible um, and it, it forces a harder decision on them. 
Um, Do you mind if I still interact with yeah. this before you go back to the to the other point? So yeah, go for it. the same. So I I I the, I think you're stating the the opinion very clearly, and I'm grateful for that because our disagreement now I think is very clear. I don't think that all or nothing is an advantage. Uh, all or nothing, I think that eight equilibrium. So I would think it it would be an advantage if I didn't have strong opinions about the way it will go, but I do, and I think it's very reasonable to assume that eventually. Uh, the, for everything which is happening with uh, censorship everywhere and increasing on political censorship in any, in any kind of direction and uh, context, I think what will happen will be anyway nothing. So it will be either uh, no Bitcoin and no Monero at all or Bitcoin and Monero, but if you sign a message with your name, with your Monero private key uh, before you receive to an address, I mean, I can... So the a, a, like a, a incidental parenthesis in this discussion is that you cannot really enforce fungibility at protocol level. You can, in the sense that you can make a protocol that makes fungibility uh, the the the, the prefer the the least energy the least the, uh, the the least resistant path. But you can always ask a, a, a withdrawing customer to provide the identifying information before you let them withdraw or deposit. So you can always off band make it worse. My point is, uh, with Monero, well, I, I think they will arrive to nothing. But if you don't have a strong all or nothing situation, you can buy more time to basically save more customers. So I think it's a, it, the plausible deniability between: Am I using Wasabi or not? Am I using a fake coin join, a real coin join, a pay join? It's an advantage, a strategic, a tactical advantage in a strategic scenario where eventually there is no other way around. They will just shut down anything which is not strictly whitelisted and nominal because I think that's the clear direction. So probably the disagreement is that is, is that we have a different bet on the future of this. I think it will go any way to total censorship and whitelisting. And so Bitcoin will not have this kind of uh, double... Uh, so governments will will fix fungibility in a way because they, they will just make requests more and more absurd until they just get to a, a, some, a fake Bitcoin, which is indistinguishable from a, a spreadsheet with your name on from PayPal, basically. Yeah, I mean, and the the future that you're, you're talking about, I think is uh, a lot of the reason why in Monero, we focus on building things to make it so that even if regulators say no more Monero, we have the tools available to keep Monero alive and keep people getting access sure. to it. Um, but I, the, the one thing I want to pick apart there in what you were saying is you can enforce fungibility at the protocol level and Monero does that and it is fungible at the protocol level. Just because someone says all of this, because it's fungible, they have to say all. All of this is something you can't use. That doesn't make it non-fungible. That makes it fungible because each Monero is equal with each other Monero. But it means that they are just deciding that that fungible asset can't be used. But that doesn't well, but that doesn't actually change the fungibility of the asset because it, the fungibility is not can you spend a currency. It's are specific units of this currency equal to other units of the same value. And within like, Monero, that's always I, I know, true. Whereas within Bitcoin, it's not. So Monero would still be fungible in that case where regulators say you can't touch Monero, and I don't, they would my, say my that example... because it's fungible. Uh, the example I'm giving you now, it's technically absurd, so I, will, I, will, I could elaborate a better one, but just to understand each other. I could just ask the user, if you want to deposit, you have to provide me with a signed message from any previous spender that will reveal which key was used in the rig signature. So you can ask, with the whitelisting, you can put any kind of burden of de-anonymization and defungibilization on Monero. You cannot uh, prevent, um, you cannot really prevent users from revealing uh, which path did any Monero choose. Of course, doing the way I just explained would be incredibly difficult, but th there, there may be other creeping way to just reveal what you did in Monero as well. The point is just making it super expensive, super difficult, super, super non-optimal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think that's a good, a good way to give a a stark example that you can, yes, you can reveal that information and choose to make your own history transparent to someone. You can do that with a Monero with a few keys um, for good reasons. And obviously you could be pressured yeah. into doing them for bad yeah. reasons, just like within Bitcoin, you could, you could be forced to prove something. 
Um, but yeah, no, I think that's a reasonable, reasonable approach that I guess it's still fungible at the protocol level, but yes, then if you're revealing all that history and showing it, um, that changes things. I don't know if it, it, it gets into weird semantics on whether or not it's still fungible, but it would, it would affect the ability for you to spend something easily for sure. Um, the same thing could happen with Bitcoin or cash. I mean, the, the same thing cash as well. Yeah. Cash today, numbers. Yeah. If you yeah. get over $10,000 in the U S you have to have these reports filed. You have to give over ID, lots of other stuff that goes into it. But no, I think that is a good point that there's still layers that can be placed on top of it, even if it's fungible at the protocol level to, um, basically make it painful to actually use as a currency. Um, jumping back real quick to what we were talking about before. Um, you, you mentioned that running a Bitcoin node is already too hard in your opinion. Um, which is interesting because I think that many, many people still run Bitcoin nodes on simple single board computers, raspberry Pis, that kind of thing. Um, within Monero, I definitely want to talk more about darknet market usage because, uh, yeah, what you hinted at there is, is interesting, but, um, I think even at Monero's current scale, which as far as I can tell, includes the vast majority of darknet market usage. Um, I, I run a node on my phone, an old pixel 4a, no problems at all. Um, initial block download took two days, not a big deal after that stays up to sync. No problems at all. It's certainly not something that is impossible. Obviously if we were 10 times as large or whatever, it would get much more difficult. And then that, that TXO set that we talked about earlier that you can't prune becomes more problematic because you have to have a, a minimum level of storage. But I think that the difficulty of running a node is, is often very overstated. Um, and there's been a lot of efforts specifically in, in Monero, but there's also some great pre-builds in Bitcoin um, to simplify that process of running a node. And it, I think people make it too daunting far too often uh, to run a node, whereas many people have an old laptop they have lying around, they have an old phone, they have something that they could just spin up, set up at home and leave running. And then they don't need to run a node on their actual phone that they use. They, they just run that one, connect all their devices to it and, and call it a day. So I, I think that the, the node running piece is, is definitely overstated. But again, if, if we're talking about, is everyone going to transact on the base layer? No, not in Bitcoin, not in Monero. No, N neither of those is going to be true. And uh, I think that's a core and okay trade off with using a, a globally decentralized, uh, consensus layer that has a, a blockchain that's immutable and all of these things that we love about Bitcoin is an immensely valuable thing and something we need, but we obviously need ways to be able to, to scale that out. So layer two networks like lightning are interesting there. Um, and the other thing that you were mentioning was uh, kind of omission instead of obfuscation. Um, I'm curious, it may be more outside of the scope of what we want to talk about today, but I'm curious to hear what, what your, picture of that looks like at a base layer. I mean, I, I definitely understand that one of the core potential benefits of the lightning network is that you gain a lot of omission of individual transaction data because that those transactions best case happen just between you and a direct peer worst case happen across a network. Um, but not every single one of those transactions is recorded to an immutable public ledger. Um, and so that's one of the, the big privacy benefits or potential benefits of lightning or be careful with that, um, that yeah. you can gain strong privacy through that omission. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I would love to see a lightning network like layer two on Monero as well, because again, we don't want to be publishing this stuff to an immutable ledger if we can avoid it. And so using something like a, a payment channel based network where we can move a lot of those individual transactions off and then just settle back to a base layer layer that is, uh, uh, able to be globally verified and all of the, the fun stuff that comes with that. Um, I think that is the, at least right now, the optimal approach long-term because there are a lot of benefits to omission and, and just the ephemerality that comes with other types of networks um, on top of base layers like Bitcoin and Monero. So I definitely do see, see the value there, but that is basically impossible to do at a base layer where you need to be able to validate all of these details. You need to be able to validate the money supply. You need to be able to validate double spin prevention. You need to be able to, to check all of these things that you don't need to be able to do at an upper layer because you're able to do them at the base layer. Um, so 
maybe we can get into that or maybe we just want to jump into other topics because that well, i feel like we could go for one, four or six if, hours at this point <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so much to say so much to say go ahead, <laughs> as you prefer if you want i can give you a brief uh, i i did it already but i can get a little bit more into some details of what i yeah. mean with the alternative of obfuscation. I, i'm glad that we agree that if we have the choice between obfuscation and omission we we should go for a mission for sure. and I, i'm very happy that we agree with Jaco, that. let me let me just wrap up the, the first topic though so with with sure. scalability being you seeing as being one of the primary issues with monero you, i mean it, it's it's you admit it's it's not an order of magnitude uh difference in terms of bitcoin and monero uh you know in terms of the the, the, the block size and things like that uh the transaction sizes it's you know uh, TXO set could get to an order of magnitude i think uh because with more and more in signature just grows. I, I I would have to check actually the function, but I think and, that and the, and the points that that Seth was making, if if you're trying to use Bitcoin in a private way, effectively it it's it's becomes larger than Monero. Um, the blockchain, not the UTXO set. Yeah. Yes. So you don't you don't see a scenario where Monero benefits from Metcalf's law and you know uh, Nielsen's law in the in the same way that Bitcoin likely will and for some time will be able to scale on chain. You think Monero is, is is critically different from Bitcoin in such a way that it just can't scale on chain and benefit from those natural progressions of technology and the progression of of Mon the. Monero itself, maybe we have to, you know, realize that too. Monero is constantly evolving and becoming more efficient over time. Let's put it this way: I don't see Bitcoin faring very well about scalability on the, on the base layer because it sucks, and uh, and I see Monero doing strictly worse, Chetris Paribus, because of of these two reasons. And I think that uh, uh, that's for me it's reason enough to not dismiss, of course, but not prioritize. Uh, any kind of obfuscation technique and try to to focus my mind uh, and my attention and my scarce time on uh, of omission techniques of, of uh, in, including second layers and stuff okay okay uh do you do you want to continue on with them with lightning network stuff or do you want to go on to what your second criticism of uh monero is uh, j just a quick thing about uh, uh protocol level omission uh, that, that Seth asked about. So of course, Lightning is is omission because you just create the channel and you stay there. And with L2, you could have a multi-party channel, so you stay there more with the channel factories and stuff. So I see a lot of omission with Lightning. But protocol level, I think we have two kinds of possible solution uh, in, in something like Bitcoin that we'll be interested to see. One I think is realistic, which is a strong signature aggregation. So even if we cannot uh, uh, avoid anti the public for the public ledger, we can reduce at least the signature point, uh, which can also incentivize coin join. For example, cross input signature aggregation is well, we already have intra input signature aggregation, which is taproot, which will benefit Lightning because finally you can you will let, be able to close the Lightning channel without showing that it's to, that's the Lightning channel. And people will be incentivized to do that because we'll spend less if they just use one key instead of two. If we add the cross input signature aggregation, that would be great because one coin join will cost you less than a non coin join transaction, Ceteris Paribus. So a lot of people will use something like gem market, not because they pay more because they want privacy, but because they save fees. And that would be very powerful and protocol wise. Then the, the, the further step will be even cross transaction input aggregation, which is possible with NAR. That's tricky because in a way it could actually go against the incentive to coin join. Because in this case, the, the miners could non-interactively aggregate. So you would have scalability, but it will not incentivize. So I think we will have to be very careful there, but there are a lot of things we can do with aggregation of stuff. And then as I was mentioning briefly before, the maximum point would be something like client side validation. So it will be a blockchain where the miner are just basically processing uh, UTX suspending without any kind of added field of script, of signature, of amount, nothing. And all the information about the, that there is just a spending with a commitment to something off chain. And I send you the thing off chain. And uh, so I have to pay you. I sign everything, the contract, the signature. I give it to you directly on a peer to peer level. And on the blockchain, I only spend the TXO without anything else. 
And this DXO can be uh, also aggregated in Mimbo Wimbo like stuff. Of course, this this stuff, this kind of stuff in Bitcoin will probably maybe with an extension block, but will probably never happen. So one of the things we are trying to do is to create this for for shit coins, basically for assets. This, this is basically the base of the project RGB that I was sponsoring was 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 marketed as token stuff. But the idea was uh, you you are creating something with a strong privacy, and then you could create uh, I don't know how someday some kind of two way pegging where you block a Bitcoin, you create the RGB Bitcoin, you send that completely client side without touching the blockchain with all the information beyond the double, the anti double spending. But anyway, sorry, this probably off topic. I just was triggered to discuss into this, but you're right. It's uh, it's it's too much of topic. <laughs> I think it's definitely interesting. I mean, especially cross input signature, signature aggregation, because it's one of the few things that actually incentivizes privacy in theory on, on Bitcoin. Um, so there's a lot of promise there. I still don't know if I would call that omission. I feel like it's a little bit of a stretch to call it omission instead of a different type of obfuscation, but it is certainly an improvement. I mean, well, but you don't you, have any not right on the in... output side. You are not writing the, the signatures, right? You, you are just writing one instead of all. So it's a small omission, but it, you are saving space instead of yeah. taking more space. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We can probably move on to the next point, though. Yeah, let's move yeah, on sure. to that and move on to the next one. I'm actually, I'm kind of surprised that the, you list scaling as uh, up there with your Monero concerns. If if you kind of agree that that Bitcoin equally or on some level has a scaling issue as well, uh, so you know it's like. If you think it could be solved in Bitcoin with layer two, I don't know why it's it's more of a deeper flaw in Monero if it can't just be solved with a layer two in, in Monero. And because the choices of obfuscation will make uh, second layers harder and they just make uh, uh, the transactions and, and the exo set larger now. But it's not, it's not an imp- So if only Monero existed and, and about the monetary maximalist, uh, I, I was about uh, if Monero existed before Bitcoin, I would just say, okay, we will fix this with second layer on Monero. It's not impossible to fix. It's not something that will do Monero. I think something that uh, I think that the direction that Monero took, just as Zcash and others for privacy, was initially a completely obfuscation-based direction. And several years ago, also discussing with many things, many people, including Fluffy, I was convinced that it was. A wrong direction, and we should go on the other way, uh, leaving the blockchain go uh, be and, and try to take everything we can outside the blockchain. So, it, but it's not something that Monero cannot do. Monero can have second layers. It's just slightly more difficult because of because of the choice made so far. Yeah, a couple of things I want to throw in there. One thing I want to clarify that I should have said earlier is that. I think it's important to distinguish that Monero, the only piece of the privacy that is obfuscation and not encryption, which I think are, are that is a key difference, is the ring signature mechanism. So that, that membership proof is obfuscation, whereas the amount hiding and the address hiding are encryption in a, an easier sense. That's still semantic, but it's much more of a, it's actually being completely hidden there. The amount is completely non-visible. The addresses are completely unlinkable from uh, public addresses, but the ring signature is obfuscation. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to monerotalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.